do a brief introduction to SEO, which I am going to try using uh, my first Google Air broadcast. So we'll see how it goes. Um, SEO is a big topic to cover in an hour, so I'm going to give you kind of a broad brush stroke, and I'll try to give you some bits and pieces to help you go off and investigate the things um, that you find interesting. So firstly, SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. Um, basically, the art and science of trying to get traffic out of search engines. So we'll start kind of where all of this stuff should start with measurement. It's a brief overview of if you have a website, this is pretty much where your traffic comes from. So if you're using an analytics package like Google Analytics, all of your traffic will come from one of these three main sources. It would be referral, um, where it comes from another website. So somebody clicked on a link on another website um, and then got sent to your website or direct, so they've come directly to your website, um, either through something like a bookmark or having it having typed your URL in directly, or they come via a search engine. And if they come via a search engine, there's pretty much two options. Either they can click on a paid ad, or they can come via the free, what we call organic traffic. And within organic traffic, there's pretty much two types. Either they've typed in your brand, as in uh, they were looking for ASOS, and they typed ASOS in to a Google search, and they hit the top um, result, and they knew you existed already. Or they come through what we call organic non-brand. So they've come through free traffic in a, in a Google search page for something like uh, buy shoes, right? So they didn't really know who was going to be there on the search page when they typed it in. but using search engine optimization techniques, you have made it so that your website and your brand appears there and people click on you. So search engine optimization is basically looking at this organic non-brand traffic and trying to help you get more of it. So there's three kind of key things to understand right at the start or three key tools to use. Firstly, Google Analytics, which um, I'm sure you've all had a look at and all understand. It basically shows you how people use your website. The flip side of that is Google Webmaster Tools, and that is basically how search engines see your website. So you, as, a, as an SEO or somebody who's interested in getting traffic from search engines, you want to keep both of these in mind, kind of how people use your website and how search engines see your website. The third thing I think is key these days is something like schema.org, also helping you uh, specify your website better to help search engines understand it better. So I'll flick over here and basically just do a two minute run through of analytics. So I will pick this website. So this is my uh, personal website. And basically, Google Analytics has a couple of key uh, bits of information it's giving you. So these four up here, generally not going to be that useful to you. Um, Real-time stuff is only if you have a mega audience and you're interested in seeing all your, your visitors in real time. These four are the ones you're going to use um, mostly. So if you click on audience, you get an idea of the people who are coming to your website, right? So kind of uh, their language, their location. I'll click on it for my website. Most of my traffic comes. Uh, through the States, through the UK, or through Poland. And to be honest, Poland is probably me, because that's where I am at the moment. Um, and you can get a lot of other interesting stuff, like mobile devices is quite interesting. Right, so exactly what people are visiting my website on. A lot of people visit on the iPhone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it tells you a bit about your audience. Acquisition is telling you where your audience is coming from. Right, so things like channels are very useful. For me, people come through organic search. Some come through referral, which is other websites. Um, some come through social, so they've um, come via Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. And some have come directly to my website, either because they've bookmarked it or um, typed it in. Right. So acquisition is basically telling you where people are coming in from. Let's see if I have any campaigns I can show you. No, nothing running. So if you've tagged things up, um, uh, 
and I'll show you uh, quickly how to tag things up. Right. So I have ran a few campaigns in the past. One I called Facebook advertising, which is obviously um, ads from Facebook, stuff I was doing in Buffer, some tests I've done myself, um, something through an email campaign. Right. So when you send traffic, you can using something called the Google URL builder. You can pretty much uh, send, if you're sending traffic to something like an email, uh, you can tag that up uh, so that the data appears here in your analytics. So let's say for me, uh, let's try bcu.co, sorry, ac. UK um, campaign source might be uh, call it me Stephen and my medium might be cost per click it might be email uh, let's give it an email and a campaign name so this can be kind of BCU SEO test if we like so when I take that so I could put that in an email um, I can put that anywhere basically when I do this so when I click on this link, it's going to take me to BCU, and it will, in the data for my visit, will write that the source was Stephen, that the medium was email, and the campaign was this. So if I hit this, if you logged into BCU's Google Analytics right now and you went to source, you'd see my visit with the source of Stephen, the medium of email, and a campaign of BCO. BCU SEO test, right? So it's very useful where you have control of the links that people are going to click, um, especially for things like email campaigns, especially for things like social, like advertising, Facebook, Twitter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, come to the URL builder, tag it up, you know, paste this into your email, and then you're able to understand much more about people, right? So let's say. Um, I can see people who come through Facebook advertising see a few more pages per session than people who come through Buffer, right? But maybe people who come through Buffer hang around a little bit longer than people who come through the Facebook advertising. And that's probably because I sent them to do two different things, right? Maybe the Buffer thing was a, a long piece of content that I was expecting them to read. Right, so for analytics and to be an SEO and basically to do anything online where you have a website on the other end, you should really get yourself familiar with Google Analytics. So we've looked at audience acquisition. Behavior is the other super interesting bit. So I'll give an example here. I'll look at the landing pages. All right, so over the years, most people have landed on my homepage. A certain number have gone to my Facebook advertising tips page and various other pages. Right, so you can do a lot of interesting things when you start getting data, understanding you know, people who went to that specific page, how did they interact with my site, what did they do or what didn't they do. Right, and I can look at things like bounce rates and session duration and I can set up some goals. Um, so the fourth one is goals. For my personal website, I don't really have any. I'm not really interested in that, but for any e-commerce site, they would have goals set up here like uh, conversion rate, goal completion, and then I have a goal value, which is actually, you know, um, the value of items people bought on the website. So you'd, you'd be able to figure out people who came through a very specific email campaign uh, that you ran just before Christmas, kind of exactly how they interacted with your website and how much money you got out of that campaign. So core to just about everything in, the, in a, being an SEO is being able to measure the impact of the traffic you send, and Google Analytics is pretty much your tool for that. Webmaster Tools, on the other hand, is how search engines see your site. So here's my little website. It's appeared in the last month 2,800 times, of which 58 times somebody's clicked through from the search results. Um, I have 19 pages in Google's index which is pretty much about the number of pages on my site. There's a few interesting things you can look at in here that give you insight into how Google sees your site. Uh, search queries is a great one. So I see kind of what my website appears in. So obviously, um, 
it's going to appear in a lot of searches for the term first conversion. It appears um, when people search marketing agency for startups. Um, it's appeared 20 times. Twice people have clicked to come through to my website. But actually, the average position in the search result is like 42. So most of the times, it's on page 5 in search results. So you can imagine it's not actually getting much traffic. Um, and for me, this is quite interesting because you know I want my website to appear for things like Facebook Advertising Agency. So if you're coming in for your website and see you're ranking for all kinds of weird things that you're not expecting, well, it means the content on your site is probably not correct for the goals you have. And if you have goals like I want my website to rank for the term red shoes, you want to be able to see it in here. You want to see how many times it's appearing for the term red shoes and kind of what the click through rate is, right? And you want to see if you can do anything to improve the click through rate. And you want to see if you can do anything to improve the average position, right? So I'm generally on page one for the term Facebook optimization. And as an SEO, I'm thinking actually, can I bump my website up a little bit from position 8.1? To maybe position three on that search results page um, and see if I can get a bit more traffic, get a few more clicks and a few more people through to my website. So the crawl thing is quite interesting, mostly because it gives you nice graphs. Um, but you can see from my website, I, Google is telling me the number of pages it crawls each day, it tells me the size of, of data it's downloading. Um, and the time spent, right? So one of the factors in ranking is how long it takes Google to download a page, because basically it extrapolates that that's how long it takes a user to download a page. So the faster your website loads, the better Google thinks your website is for the end user, and uh, the better you will rank using just the, the site speed part of the algorithm. Right, so uh, an average speed of kind of half a second is pretty good, and some of my pages load in about a fifth of a second. So I'm happy with the site speed. You know, when I do consulting and I arrive on a site, and it's, you know, the average is like two seconds to load a page. Then as an SEO, you go and you figure out why things are taking so long, um, and you try and prove the, the kind of basically the speed with which a, a website loads. Right, so. Make sure you understand how users interact with your site. Also, make sure you understand how kind of search engines interact with your site. Uh, the third one I'm saying is schema.org. Basically, these search engines, being Google, Yahoo, and Yandex, got together and said, this is the standard for marking up uh, your website. Right. So. Um, I'm going to do this from Warsaw, so let's see what we get when we do this. Um, okay, cool. So do this from the UK, and you'll maybe get something slightly different. Okay, I'm in google.co.uk, so it is giving me a lot of British results anyway. So you can see here Ticketmaster um, has basically dates and theaters and places appearing for its search results. Um, and let's let's compare that maybe against the Lyceum Theatre, which doesn't have that, even though they're both kind of promoting the same event. And that's because Ticketmaster is using schema markup to pass more structured information to Google uh, about the contents on its page. And Google is able to interpret that and say, actually, we understand that on Sunday, the 15th of March, at the Lyceum Theatre, you can go see The Lion King, right? So, and there are now tons and tons and tons of different uh, ways to tell Google about the content on your site. So you can come in here, have a bit of a read around, click through and see the types and properties, right? So there's stuff for many, many different things. Recipes is one you're going to see a lot. So if you do a, let's do a search for, um, I don't know. Cheesecake recipe. Mm, not seeing too much in the way of markup. You're seeing obviously the rating markup, right? So you need to put that markup on your site to actually be able to pull the ratings through. Um, 
that's pretty much what I'm seeing at the moment in terms of markup. Have a look from the UK, see if you see anything different to what I'm seeing here. Right, um, other things you can do, events, and that's what we're seeing with the Lion King tickets. Um, kind of the stars that you'll see everywhere are specified through schema. So if you have something that's kind of repetitive and you have lots of content that's the same thing, come and have a look at schema.org, see if you can mark that up. Right, you can see here um, examples of schema.org markup. Um, I guess here they're, they're telling people that Bob Smith is a name, it's giving it a property. So have a read through, have a look. Um, depending on what you, on the content of your site, marking on your marking your website up with schema can really help convey the correct information to search engines. And kind of half of the battle with SEO is making sure that search engines understand the content on your website. And that's what schema uh, .org is kind of exists for to help you tell search engines more clearly uh, what the content on your website is about. Right. So have a look at schema.org, have a play, have a wander through it. Um, one, I think one of the easiest ways to understand how kind of search engines get where they are today is to look at the history of search, history of search engines. And this is an ugly but very useful um, infographic, although I stumbled to use the actual term infographic to describe this. But really, if you go and look at the, at the history of search right at the start of, of the internet, you basically just have things that list you know, the sites that are on the internet. There are so few, you could just make a list of them. And you get, as more sites start to come on, uh, you need, you know, new businesses and new search engines kind of came into being to handle the increasing complexity of dealing with the amount of information that was available, right? So if you're looking in 1990, the first, first attempts at organizing the web, you come down here to 1994 and you've got Yahoo. And like the, the thing that really that Yahoo did that has a lot of hangover to the current day is that you could pay to be included in the Yahoo directory. So really, from day one, people were uh, getting used to being able to pay to be ranked. And that hangs over a lot to today because that's the way um, kind of people had their expectations initially set. Like If I want to be at the top of a search engine, I can just pay money for that to happen. But then pretty much Google came around in 96, launching in 98. Um, and they were working on something called PageRank. So PageRank is named after Larry Page. And it is kind of ranking pages based on the quality of the links linking to those pages. So you can imagine um, all, all things being equal, Google would probably rank the BCU website ahead of my own first conversion website because BCU has lots of powerful links coming in from really trustworthy places. And that's the other, kind of the second half of STO, is trying to make sure you've got lots of powerful links coming in from trustworthy places. Um, and basically, over the years, SEOs have tried to do that. So the one half of SEO is making sure search engines understand what your website's about and what your content's about. And the other half is trying to convince them that they should rank your content above everybody else. All right, and a few other people have come along after Google and tried to do interesting things, but they really haven't. Um, nobody's been much better than Google, and there've been a few notable crazy failures, like cool. So have a have a read through if you're interested in that. So part of the joy of being an SEO really is playing around with. Uh, looking at other people's websites. So robots.txt um, is basically how you specify to a web crawler what it should or shouldn't crawl on your website. And the reason that's important is if you have a mega website, uh, you don't, you 
pretty much want to manage where a search engine crawls because let's if you take ASOS for an example or Tesco for an example you may have millions of items um, and you want to make sure that the search engines crawl the pages that have your products on or have the most expensive products on because those are the ones you want people to find in search engines um, and click through and buy on your site so I'm going to quickly have a look at some oh, kill that so let's look at BCU at their robots.txt. So this is a standard, anything you're interested in, any website you like, just go and type robots.txt off to the home page and have a look what's there. And BCU is not doing very much. Basically, what it's saying is user agent, which basically spider. So it's just saying all spiders are not allowed to go and look at BCU slash search, um, which is quite common. Um, and it's trying to specify a crawl delay. So I think that's about two seconds. Um, sometimes spiders get trapped in parts of the sites and they can be querying your site a lot. So your system administrators uh, may, may try to slow down the rate at which spiders query your site. So that's not a very interesting one. And let's look at something a bit more interesting. You can go to Google itself and see what it allows spiders to have a look at or not have a look at. And this becomes much more interesting. Right? So you can see they're working really hard at what they allow to be spiders and what they don't allow to be spidered. Uh, and sometimes you can find like uh, interesting things that they haven't launched yet. Like, what on earth is JSky? I have no idea. Why don't you go have a look? Right. So they're, they're very much allowing spiders to look at some stuff and stopping them from looking at other stuff and quite often you want to do that because there may be a lot of duplicate pages on your website so you could see BCU was blocking search pages so what happens when you search is you can quite often get the same content being displayed uniquely um, on different URLs and basically you're kind of serving the same stuff to search engines over and over and over again um, and it, it means that search engines don't get to your unique stuff that you definitely want to show them. So most websites will block uh, the crawlers from looking at the same kind of content. So you quite often see that search is blocked or um, any ways where you can um, kind of reorder content, right, uh, is quite often blocked. Uh, other interesting things, maybe stuff like, I mean, ASOS, maybe an interesting one to go and have a look at. Um, so you can see they're not allowing people to see this holding stuff. Um, they've got some test pages, which they don't want popping up in search, which um, is probably uh, a good idea. They have an archive of Cheryl Kroll, Kroll stuff that they don't want popping up in, in search. Huh. They have a legal exclusion, which is quite interesting. Uh, maybe Angora is some is a trademark, and they don't want their name popping up. They don't want their website popping up in search for the term Angora. I'm actually going to just search that right now. I don't know. Interesting. I'd love to know why they, what the legal reason is there. Um, and you can see here marketing exclusions, right? I don't know what Discover Intimate Britney Spears is. Maybe go and have a look and try and figure out why they don't want that appearing in search results. Um, and as we spoke about before, they're stopping search engines from uh, the spiders from going into their search results because they're basically the spiders will just keep going through their search results, putting up exactly the same information, just in a slightly different order. Um, so that's quite interesting. You can play around with stuff like... And see what Tesco do and don't want you to have a look at. I'd be quite interested to go and see what's on this uh, investor information URL that they want to delete. All right, so Robux exclusion is what you use to tell search engines where they can and can't go on a website. And it's also quite fun when you do it to other people's websites. Similarly, you have sitemaps, which are normally presented as sitemap.xml. And 
it's a way of specifying the URLs specifically to Google to say, these are the URLs on my website that I want you to look at. All right. Um, and you would actually see that. Let's find. Here, if I had uh, uploaded one for my website, you would see the sitemaps here. It would I may say like to Google, here are 20 URLs that I want you to index, and it would tell me it's index 19. And I didn't have to go figure out why it hasn't indexed that last one. Is my Does my content suck? Have I accidentally blocked it off from search engines by not providing any links to that page for the search engines to use to find the content? Right. So these two things, sitemap.xml, uh, you specify that. Search engines know to go and look at your domain.sitemap.xml. Um, and then you can figure out by looking at webmaster tools kind of which pages have has Google found and indexed or not found or found but not indexed as well. So normally when they find stuff and they don't put it in the index, it means they think it's low quality or it's um, a copy of stuff they already have. Right. So actually, let's play with the sitemap quickly with... Um, Right, so if you look at asos.com, actually their main sitemap just tells you to go and look for country-specific sitemaps. So they have a British sitemap here, they have a Russian sitemap, um, Spanish, French, Italian, US English, German one. Yeah, so let's go look at the British one. And you see on their British site, they're actually grouping their sitemaps. So there's one which just looks like main content on their site. There's another sitemap just for men's news and for women's news, right? So I guess they're trying to understand out of the bits on their site that are men's news, um, how much of that is being held in Google's index. Right? So let's go look at the main stuff. And now you can see the exact pages that ASOS tells a search engine to go in spider. So ASOS is saying, these are the pages on our site that we want you to include in your index. And by matching that up with what it, it actually tells you it indexes in Google Webmaster Tools, you can understand kind of what percentage of your site is held in the index or isn't, and gives you an idea of where to go um, to start working, to start improving your site or checking. So it says like this big chunk of your website is not held in the Google index. You go and figure out why. So a, a lot of um, kind of consulting work that I do as an SEO is helping people understand why bits of their site aren't showing up in Google, right? And often that's because the quality of the pages is not high enough in terms of unique text or unique content, or they've accidentally done something like blocked off access to the site by not putting a link to it or accidentally uh, blocked it off in robots txt by telling search engines specifically don't go and index these pages right so um, on large sites like this like asos um, with loads of changes happening all the time things can quite often go wrong that require you to kind of go back in and understand what's happening and, and change things and fix things so with robots, txt, and sitemap.xml, you can kind of understand uh, where to send traffic and also kind of tell Google or search engines what to include and understand what they're not including. So this is really kind of the what is the killer feature of the of, of the modern search engine, I suppose. And that is arranging uh, the results on the search engine results pages um, in an order that they determine via an algorithm. And the algorithm basically probably today has about 500 different moving parts. One of those parts, uh, like I mentioned earlier, would be site speed. So you know, the quicker your site loads, 
the better mark you're going to get on that part of the algorithm. Another bit is kind of links. The the more links you have, you know, that's one of the the bits of the algorithm. And the more links you have, the better. But other bits of the algorithm could be, you know, the higher the quality of the links you have, the better. Or if you have lots of links and they're all low quality, that could be a negative part of the algorithm. So over the years, I mean, really, they start out with very simple, with the algorithm being a few very simple things, like how many links does this page have? If this link, if this page has more links than another page, then we'll rank it above the other page. But as soon as SEOs kind of started to realize that, start to understand the algorithm, they start to try and manipulate that. So then kind of like in a, in a nuclear arms race, Google tries to make their algorithm um, makes a better algorithm. Search and SEOs try to take advantage of it. Google tries to improve it. And this has kind of been the last um, 15 years or so of people like myself trying to outwit Google. And that works for a little while. And then they, all the bright minds there, improve their algorithm. Um, so basically, the killer feature that it started with was this, this page rank algorithm that was able to rank pages. Nothing else before really had a good way to say, this page is better than this other page. And that's why uh, they've done so well, because they could serve better content to users. Um, and really, I want to talk about that, because when you do SEO, you end up with all these questions about why on earth is this thing like this? And honestly, it's because we're, we're at where we are today, not through any kind of a plan, right? The internet is really young. Um, some people did weird stuff at the beginning that brings us to where we are today, right? So you used to be able to pay to be at the top of a search results page. And then Google came along and said, you can't pay. And, but people still felt entitled to buy their way to the top, which is why you have a lot of spammers, right? Um, so the internet is quite weird, and sometimes SEO is quite weird. There's a really great um, three-minute long video by Matt Cutts. Um, Matt, oh, it's just hidden B. I should have thought about that beforehand. Hey, it's hidden behind here. I'll share that in an email. It's a three-minute long video with Matt Cutts, who's the head of Google's search spam team, just explaining from Google's point of view how search engines work. And really, that boils down to these six things. Uh, Google spiders the web. They send their bots out. Their bots follow links, basically, on web pages to understand the entirety of the internet, like what's out there. They grab the URLs, and they grab the content of the pages. Um, and they bring that back to Google, which is placed in the index, right? So when you type in uh, buy red shoes, Google will go and search their index against your search query. It will analyze all the pages that could potentially be an answer to your query buy red shoes, which is quite often when you go to Google and actually do this, you see this thing up at the top. That's this, in Google's index, there are 200 million pages that could potentially be an answer to the query by red shoes. All right. So a lot of work as an SEO is making sure that you're at the top of these, this 200 million kind of long results page. They then rank the pages, and they serve them to you. Right. So they're deciding with their algorithm that Debenhams here should be the top organic query, and Amazon should be number two. So a question for you, really, is kind of what do you think could be part of this algorithm? If I say there's about 500 different parts of the algorithm, um, and they're probably all kind of fundamentally changed or improved in some way about once a year. So they're changing that algorithm pretty much daily uh, to improve it. But you have things like the speed of your site, the number of links you have, the quality of those links, kind of the kind of the the number of unique domains that those links come from. 
right? So think about if you've got a million links from one website, is that more or less powerful than one link each from a million websites? Well, actually, one link from a million websites is probably going to be a much better uh, signal of quality than one website giving you a million links. Right. So a big question for you, and I know you guys are using WordPress and you're using uh, Yoast's plugin. So Yoast's plugin, if you just go and look at all the fields in that, does a pretty good job of explaining to you uh, what's important when you need to tell Google what a web page or a website is about. And we'll look at a few things in, in, a, in a few minutes about how to correctly convey information to a search engine. The other bit is how does Google decide which site is better than another, right? So this bit of the algorithm is about helping a search engine understand what's on your page. And this bit of the algorithm is about convincing a search engine that your page should be above everybody else's page, right? So it's quite interesting to think of the algorithm in two ways. One, how do I explain things to Google? And two, how do I influence Google, if you like? Right. Something to uh, to think of really is how would Google decide if you were a brand in your space? Kind of what makes Nike a brand? Right. So things that make Nike a brand are um, it's mentioned almost every day on massive websites like the BBC and CNN, whereas your small website isn't. Uh, Nike will have a lot of links to it which maybe your website won't. Uh, people will link to Nike with the term Nike in the anchor text of the link, right? So uh, big brands like Nike will have like 90% of all the links pointing to it on the internet, which are probably in the millions, will actually just say Nike or variations of Nike, Nike running shoes, uh, Nike shoes, Nike shirts, right? And those the words in those links help Google understand actually what's on the Nike website as well. So basically what you're trying to do, Google likes brands because basically people like the security of brands. So if you understand the bits of the algorithm that make Google, that help Google understand that something, that a website is actually a big ass brand, then you want to try and copy those things as well. And you want to also understand how can you measure that and how do you understand if you're giving the algorithm the wrong signals? How do you understand if you're giving the algorithm the signals that say, I'm not a big brand, I'm just a really small website, right? So an SEO does a lot of trying to understand these kind of things. So I'll go back to those two bits as an SEO. You have to make sure Google understands what your website and pages are about, and you've got to convince Google to rank your website higher than other websites. So this top bit is basically things you do on your website and to your website, and this bit is basically things you do on the rest of the internet to make them send links to you so that Google will rank you higher. All right. So here's a, an interesting question. Do people and search engines see the same thing? I'll tell you the answer is no. So here's a way you can do it. You can turn off JavaScript. So basically, uh, spiders come to your site with, they don't load the JavaScript. They just grab your HTML. They just grab what is written onto the page. And that's what they take back to the index. So you know, in the past, if you had a Flash website, which pretty much don't exist uh, anymore, if you have a JavaScript-heavy website, if you have um, all of your content in a way that the spiders can't actually see what's in the content, then your content's just not going to appear in search engines, right? So let's try this in Chrome for something like the BBC. So what would the web BBC website look like um, with and without JavaScript, like as a person sees it versus how a search engine sees it? If I can find my content settings. I will switch off JavaScript. Go to the BBC. Right, and that may kind of look like the BBC site that you know. 
But what you'll see here is when you click through, it's now loading each uh, bit of this banner as an individual URL here. So this is how it's helping search engines who have JavaScript turned off be able to navigate through the site. Right, so let's actually turn JavaScript back on and then have a look at the BBC site. All right, let's take the and off. And actually, you have quite a different website. All right, so this is very different to what we saw before. Um, and I guess that just helps you understand that a human being coming here with JavaScript on is going to see something a little bit different to what a search engine is going to see when it just comes and pretty much sees this stuff. All right. Wow, that is ugly as hell. Let's not look at the BBC one. So that's something to keep in mind constantly, basically, that search engines see things slightly different to human beings. And quite often when your content doesn't appear, it might be because you're not, like technically you've made, you've made it difficult for search engines to understand what's on your site. Uh, another way to help search engines see what's on your website and understand kind of the correct importance is through uh, your website architecture. So here's a very simple example. You have a home page, you have category pages, you have subcategory pages, and then you have your detail pages. So if you're saying like ASOS, you're like the ASOS home page, then kind of, I don't know, um, men's clothes, women's clothes, children's clothes, and then underneath each of those will be subcategories, maybe like jeans and shoes. And then down here will be like the specific uh, shoe that you're going to buy or the specific pair of jeans that you're going to buy. And the reason that site architecture is important is because this is, you know, again, from those early days of the web, this is how search spiders expect information to be laid out. They expect this hierarchy and kind of a lot of stuff that now, if you were building this from the start, you wouldn't really care about. It's actually important because this is from the history of the web, from the history of, of how crawlers work, and also the history of how page rank is passed, how page rank uh, is assigned to individual pages, comes from uh, this initial assumption that this is how information architecture, how websites are architected. So if we look at a bit more of a complex example, you'll understand that your home page typically gets the most links on a website. Your subcategory pages get a, f uh, a fewer links, and the sub subcategory pages get less. And actually, your you know the individual pages of the things you're selling get very few links. Right. So that's what a search engine expects. And when I was talking earlier about understanding a brand versus a non-brand, brands generally have most of their links coming to their home page. Right. And a signal of a spammer actually is that one of these pages, like a high value page, may like just have insane amount of links coming to this one page to try and, and, and fool the algorithm, right? So where the links come to and how they flow through your website is very important. Um, basically, let's say this page has a page rank of 10. Each hop, each hop it does through a link, um, kind of erodes a little bit of that page rank. So page rank flows down this information architecture, um, but slightly decreasing through each link. So actually, the way you build your site, the information architecture of your website is very important because you want to you want to maximize the amount of page rank that is flowing through each of these pages, through each link between these pages. The page rank is important because it influences uh, how highly Google is going to put your website uh, above other websites for search queries, All right? So here's here's kind of like a common graph. Um, so spider entry points are basically links. So loads of links come to your homepage, and then spiders keep going from there. Uh, individual little pages may get links coming in, and then spiders crawl out from those links. And kind of on mega sites, what happens is kind of sections 
of the site may not get any links. So spiders just don't find those pages. And you need to then go in and change your information architecture to help spiders get to certain parts of your website that you want people, that you want to be in Google's index, right? So it's one of these crazy things. Like in this uh, structure here, each link decreases the value of the page rank that the home page has, which means not much flows through to these pages that you do want ranking. And you would actually take this information architecture and change it into something much more like this. So you want things to be the fewest clicks away from the home page as possible, which maybe you wouldn't if you were building the website, the, the internet today, you would not say that that made much difference, but that actually makes a huge difference to rankings right now because of the way search spiders work and the way page rank works. Right. So when I'm thinking of building a site, I'm looking at an information architecture that's both uh, for the user, but I'm also considering it for the search engine. Right. So things can get quite complex. Um, but as long as you're generally in a in a tree structure, you should be okay. So another question: How do people interact with search engines? Right, I'm sure you've seen this. Um, understanding queries, understanding the kind of the queries that people do when they go to Google is very important. Right. So at the top, what we call the search demand curve. Um, there will be a, a small number of queries that happen millions of times a day. Be things like, um, what is the weather today? Or the BBC? Or uh, maybe Manchester United results, right? So on a day when they play, there's a lot of people who are looking up the results. Um, top 100 keywords, once you take that as a keyword and put it into Google and, and educate yourself uh, about what the top 100 keywords on the internet are. Um, then there's like the top 500, the top 1,000, the top 10,000, and then what is called the long tail. So loads of keywords are pretty unique when you when you have phrases that have, you know, uh, what is the weather in, I don't know, what is the weather in Warsaw on the 15th of March 2015? There's very few, and few people who put that into Google. And you need to understand, actually, where should I compete for my, my website? If um, maybe a top keyword is news, is your new website going to be able to compete with CNN, the BBC, Fox News for the term news? Um, I would say, no, it's not. So you have to pick somewhere along this curve where you think you can compete, but also uh, get enough traffic that's worth your time. Right, so maybe with your home page, you'd pick something um, that was relevant here. So think of BCU, um, like hyperlocal websites. I know are a favorite of Dave's, and I'm sure you've come across it being at BCU. So uh, maybe kind of live events in Birmingham 2015 is something that would get you a little bit of traffic um, without being too competitive. Right, so understanding the competitiveness of the keywords you're trying to target is very important, um, and being able to map, map them against kind of expected volume of traffic tells you where you should put uh, your effort in trying to rank. This is quite old, um, and this kind of explains why you wanted to get to the top of search engine results. You can tell this is really old because there's no adverts on it. Um, it's kind of hard to find a search page on any search engine these days. It's not mostly adverts. But basically, if you see here, over half the clicks went to what is at the top, right? So there's always this huge pressure to be at least in the top three because that's where all the traffic is going, right? And you can see here, if you're on page two, you're getting almost no traffic. And page three, you're getting nothing, right? So you're always trying to appear in the top three because that's where the volume of clicks will be going. And that's, of course, why Google has ads now at the top, right? Because it knows that people are clicking at the top. Another thing would be remiss of me not to mention is 
mobile growth. This is real data from um, a, a train company in the UK. And this was just looking in November, like in 09. So that's <laughs> five years ago. Um, they were starting to sell a lot through mobile. Right. So, and this trend is just continuing. Um, when I when I work with companies that that do a lot of stuff on Facebook or they're very social, more than half of their traffic comes through uh, either tablet or mobile, right? So if you're doing things that are very social, where people are sharing things on Twitter and Facebook, you have to make sure your website works on a mobile device, right? I want to spend just one or two minutes looking at different results pages on Google, kind of explaining. Things like QDF and QDD. So QDF is something within Google that says this query deserves freshness. And basically that's um, a query where mostly it's around news, right? So let's have a look. Let's have a look at something like uh, Manchester United score because I know they played today. Right. And now we see some really interesting things here, right? So the Daily Mail is ranking top in this news box, right? So this is query deserves freshness, and part of that is bringing in the news about that query, right? So maybe further down you'll have, um, and surprise, the Manchester United website actually is so far down, right? So if you're looking for something about Manchester United, probably their own website is the most official and best place to get that information unless you're looking for for news about a specific score or a specific match right then a news website or the bbc are going to be better results All right and taking that to another kind of that to the next level google is able to pull in these results and serve it in very specific boxes right so you know they're playing today and they played at four o'clock Right, so they, they they realize that this page should not be um, a set result. That's all a set set of of pages. That's always going to be the same. That these results are going to change um, pretty much every time United play a game. So that's query deserves freshness. There's also query deserves diversity, which is basically um, I'm not sure what I'm going to get here in Warsaw. Something like Lion King, right? They know people are looking for tickets to go and see it. Um, they know people are looking for uh, like ratings of the film. Some people are looking for images. Um, some people will want something like clips from the actual film, so they'll give you access to YouTube. And they'll do some disambiguation here, so so actually to look for the musical were you looking for the film right so actually they're trying to pull in a lot of different things from different places because they know when people put this in people have a lot of different ideas about what they want so actually if you are trying to compete for something let's say you want to make your own version of IMDB you are not actually competing for all of the, the positions on the page, you're actually competing for the one position that Google will give to a site like IMDb, right? Because it wants to give coverage to ticket sites, to sites about the musicals and sites about the film, and it wants to pull in video sites. So it's very important you know kind of the SERPs, the search engine results pages for the queries that you're going to target and, you know, Am I going to be like, is my traffic going to drop on days when like a sports team is playing because it's bringing in all these other things on top of it? Um, is it going to, you know, or is it going to be incredibly hard to compete for this query because actually I'm effectively, I can effectively only compete like for one spot on this page with my style of website. So it's very important to look at. Uh, when you're deciding on the keywords you want your website to rank for, is to look at these search results pages and really understand what's being shown on them, why Google is showing things on them. Um, you know, something interesting could be Max Clifford, right? So he was arrested, 
and I'm keeping snapshots of this page because I want to see what happens over time, right? So at some point, is he going to try and clean up these search results by putting, um, by trying to put new things on top and push all this stuff down below, right? So before this, uh, you can imagine before he was arrested, this page looked completely different. Right, it was just all about him as a as a PR person. Now that that's changed, you've got all this other stuff about him being arrested. Right, so uh, there's a big chunk of SEO which is actually kind of trying to clean up people's bad press and trying to suppress uh, bad things by creating Facebook pages for them and Twitter accounts for them and LinkedIn pages for them and trying to get those to rank over this stuff and push all the bad stuff down. So I'm interested to see how this page will change over the years. Um, yep. So basically, important to understand the different types of pages search engines will build in response to different types of queries. If I just show you, actually, let's put in a buying query. Um, so buy, what should we buy? I don't know. Let's see if toothpaste brings anything. Specific, I think. Nope. I'm, what I'm trying to do, which may not be working from um, from Warsaw, is to get it to pull in um, the ad image boxes. So sometimes when you when you have a really uh, conversion or e-commerce related query. Um, it will pull in a box of adverts that have images and really dominate this page, right? So it will build things from, basically, if you look at this page, if we could find something that actually also pulled in the ads with images, you can imagine that this organic result that I'm seeing would be pushed down to here, there'd be all these ad images up here, and there'd be only one organic result above the fold, and everything else would be paid, right? So actually, kind of SEO may well have had its heyday because search engines now want their money, right? So these free organic results are pushed down so that search engines can put ads on the top of the pages, right? So um, think about when you're picking your queries, actually, the types of ads that are being shown as well. So if you you want to target this kind of high conversion query, remember that Google may try to push you down and stick as many ads as it can possibly get onto this page. And you may be competing with advertisers as well as everybody else in the organic search range. Right? Um, I'm going to skip over three types of research quickly. So when I'm trying to sit down at the beginning of a campaign or the beginning of a project, you need to do research. You need to understand who else is out there and what they're doing. And that falls into kind of three big baskets. Competitor research, kind of get an idea of who is out there, what are they doing, uh, like how long have they been out there. That's part of the algorithm, right? If your website's been around for 10 years, uh, it's probably more trustworthy than my website, which has only been around for a week. Get an idea of who else is there. Um, I always like to kind of split it into global brands, local brands, and niche competitors. So if I launch the shoe shop, um, you know, Nike would be up here, but I'm not ready to compete with them. So, but there may be local brands that I want to benchmark myself against. Uh, and see what they're doing and how they're doing it, and see if I can copy or get some information of them. Niche competitors are actually um, people who have the same keywords as you, but they may have a completely different business. So uh, let's say you are, are um, you make your Samsung and you make movie screens. You know, screens for people to watch movies at home, um, like projector kind of screens. You're competing with uh, cinemas that are screening movies quite often for keywords that are very much the same. 
So quite often you're competing with companies you never um, you never expected to simply because you have keywords that you share with them. So they may sell or do something else completely different, but the keywords that users put into Google are very similar. So I try to kind of think of those as well. And most companies who don't really think in this way, they only focus on their kind of the brands that they understand, and they don't think about the other brands that they compete with but, don't, but who operate in different markets. Okay, so you want to understand what your competitors are doing, and you want to try to find some point to differentiate yourself. It's more gen general marketing than specifically SEO. Um, I'm going to skip over these tools quickly, um, and I'll show you some cool tools in a bit. The other bit is website research. Right? Some stuff I use is Xenu and Screaming Frog. These are two uh, tools. I'll show you how Screaming Frog works in a second. Um, if you want to grab stuff from websites, I'm sure you know Paul Bradshaw. Have a look at the slide share where he talks through uh, how to grab things off the internet. So um, I'm going to run this tool called Xenu. And I'm going to run it on to you. I don't want to check external links because it'll take too long. And basically, this is a spider that I've told to go and go to PCU, follow all the links on the website, and give me information back. Right? So it's running pretty quickly. I'm just going to stop it now because we have enough to talk about. Um, and it brings back all these pages and all this, all the stuff that is found on the website, which gives me um, that's probably not bad. That's probably just because I stopped it. I didn't have time to go find that. But it will tell me errors, right? It will tell me the title of the pages I'm finding, right? So um, if I have you know thousands of pages that all have the same title, then that means I'm telling Google the same thing for all these pages, and that's not optimal. Right, helps me give me an idea of the level. So it says bc.ac.uk is the top page, and these pages are uh, like one level down. And if I if I let it go, I can find everything at the second level down, and third level, and more and more and more. Right. So basically, this is my little spider that I can let loose on other websites to understand the content that's on the website. Um, a classic example of using this in SEO is, you know, a company will come to me, they say, we're not getting the results we want, um, and I'll say, well, okay, how many things, you know, how many uh, things are you selling on your website? And they'll say, like, we're selling 500 things, and then I'll run a spider on it, and I'll find, like, 300,000 web pages, or, like, half a million web pages, because they don't realize all the ways that they've accidentally created extra pages on their website. Uh, so a little tool like this is both fun and very useful for understanding what's on a website, right? That's Sinu. Um, Screaming Frog does the same, uh, just it's a bit more hardcore. Uh, keyword research is under help you understanding the keywords that people are actually putting into Google. Right, and you want to try and get some idea of the value of different keywords, um, and understand the competition, like who's going and who's trying um, to also rank for different keywords. So um, we'll skip over that. Well, I'll show you this actually. Predictive search. Let's do predictive search for red dress. So you're trying to figure out what people put into Google for for terms you care about. So if you are ASOS, you'd care about something like red dress. And anything that's appearing here is being searched a lot, right? So um, obviously red dressing ground is something put up. Maybe you'd want to create a page of red dress with sleeves. So it's more targeted to that query. You'll get fewer searches for it, but you'll be better placed to rank highly for it. Um, so obviously a song called red dress and makeup that goes along with red dresses, right? Uh, what else did I put? Do I look at something like? Winter scarf, right? Sale, knitting patterns, styles, UK, uh, colors. So that gives you an idea, like helps you expand on the keywords you're looking for. 
Um, similar search does pretty much the same thing, but down at the bottom, right? So this was for weed killer, and it tells me actually here's stuff that people also search for around the term weed killer, right? So people are putting in lawn weed killer, they're putting in liter weed killer. So it actually tells you that people are telling you, are putting into Google the volume of stuff they want to buy, as well as the way they want to use it. Um, Path clear is probably a brand, right? So then you you start to understand how people are putting their queries into search engine. Right, Uber suggest freaking awesome for this kind of stuff. Uh, what Uber suggest does is goes and pulls everything out of here for you. So let's go socks, and it basically goes and runs socks space socks plus a. You'll see everything that is in the auto suggest if you put in A, everything that's put in B, C, D, E, and all the way down uh, through numbers as well, right? So you start building up a really good idea through those three techniques of the kinds of things that people are putting into search engines. And that can help you understand what you should target for your website. There's a Google keyword tool. I won't go into that as well, but that, if you have an AdWords account, and basically having an AdWords account is just signing into AdWords with your Google uh, login, and you can start playing with that um, with a keyword planner. It's not always correct, but it does give you some interesting, does arrange words in an information architecture for you quite well. Go and play with that. Um, there's a lot of information in there. It's not very hard to just play with it and find it. Um, we'll skip Moz's stuff, skip keyword difficulty. Basically, I just want to end off by giving you some tools to go and play with. So we looked at Uber Suggest now. Um, this is Ahrefs. We'll try it on BCU. And it gives you an idea of the strength of the domain. So basically, what Ahrefs does, uh, what Moz's OpenSight Explorer does, is they try and model Google's algorithm. So they try and tell you, like for BCU, um, give you some ranking stuff. They tell you how many backlinks you have. So it's VCU according to the uh, to the crawling and index that AHRS does, has 331,000 backlinks from 5,000 unique domains, right? So then if I were to put in uh, maybe, let's say my competitor was UCL. Ah, I've reached my limits. Let's put UCL into Moz. And we get similar kind of information here, right? So you see, uh, Moz gives you things like domain authority and page authority. They're trying to model what's going on within Google, where Google is trying to figure out the authority of links. So not just the number of links, but also the quality of the links that are coming into you, right? And you'll get, also get a, a list of kind of where the links are coming from. So the strongest link that UCL has is from the BBC, right? And it gives you the anchor text of the link as well. So you can start to go through and find all the stuff out about your competitors, and it's um, it's quite interesting. Probably the most fun one, I suppose, is um, when I say fun, I mean fun for me uh, just to look at. But I'm using these in my daily work as an SEO. Um, so interesting stuff I can find out from from here is the keywords that BCU ranks for. I now know they're also doing Google AdWords um, for a Masters in Marketing. Um, for an MA in writing, for gaming jobs, it's a bit of a weird one to be advertising on. And gaming companies, a bit of a weird one to be advertising on. And I can look at the actual ads they're using, right? So maybe you clicked on one of these and joined the course. So Masters in Marketing, you'd see MA, Public Relations and Marketing, BCU. 
and their ad. So that's really useful in understanding your competitors and what other sites are doing, right? So if I was UCL, um, it may be interesting and useful to me to understand what BCU thinks is actually worth paying money to get traffic for. Right, and I can get stuff like competitors. Um, organic competitors. So PPCs, paid ad competitors, mostly guys like Ask. Organic competitors, you rank for a lot of the same queries that Learn for Good ranks for, um, and hard courses and various bits. Right, so come in here, put in your um, your competitors, understand how your competitors are working, what they're ranking for, what keywords that they want to spend money to buy on. And that's really like what's really important, right? So to understand that BCU, the guys who are doing the paid marketing for BCU, think that a master's in marketing is a really key keyword to be targeting. Um, so Majestic, Moz, Ahrefs, and SEMrush all do uh, kind of, they're all trying to look at the algorithm. Uber suggests trying to give you keywords, and Keyword Spy gives you insight into kind of what your competitors are doing, but mostly through paid search. If you want to learn more, I can heartily recommend Moz. Every Friday for like the last couple of years, they've done like a five to ten minute uh, video. It's really easy to just start learning concepts and really dig into like really individual concepts in these videos. Just go watch the videos. Rand is really engaging. They're very easy to watch and quite fun. Um, if you're in the UK, Rough Agenda is a company that puts on loads of like one day free events around digital marketing themes like email or social advertising or link building and outreach. They're really good. They have really top people speaking at them um, and you can go along for free, right? So you can go to events, you can meet people, you can be educated there, you can educate yourself on the blog. Um, I trust that's been helpful. I will answer any questions you have by email, so just send them through and I'm happy to answer anything you like.